Ariel, is this the last session of the day? This is the last session for today. Okay. So save the best for last, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All righty, I'll turn it over to you guys. You feel free to get started whenever. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to our session on Digital MD. Um, should we just get into it, do you think? <laughs> Ariel, do you think uh, people are arriving late? What's been the trend so far today? There's some people that will come a little bit later. Um, they can hop back and forth between sessions. And then I know some of them started running over on time as well. So they could just be leaving the one just before mm -hmm. this one. So up to you guys. It is being recorded though. So they can access this um, in the hub um, after the session as well. Perfect. Okay, well, since everything's being recorded and we don't want to keep our audience waiting, thank you so much for joining us. Um, today, we hope to share ideas and inspiration to help educators and administrators explore how digital scholarship and social media can really benefit all students, regardless of discipline or career path. Um, and joining me today for this session is Matt Zuckerman, um, Associate Professor at the CU School of Medicine, and also Jason Katzoff from Adobe Education as well. So as a quick intro, uh, my name is Vincent Fu. I'm currently a fourth year med student at the Anschutz campus at the CU School of Medicine. Um, I am currently in my emergency uh, medicine rotation at Denver Health and really enjoying it. Um, I will be specializing in emergency medicine as well. Um, and Dr. Zuckerman? Yep, I am Matt Zuckerman. I am uh, at the University of Colorado School of Medicine in the Department of Emergency Medicine and Division of Medical Toxicology. Uh, I am a little further along and uh, am just a huge proponent and fan of the use of social media and digital scholarship in uh, medical education, but education as a whole. And I'm Jason Katzoff, uh, Adobe Customer Success Manager. I work with the CU System of Schools based just south of Denver. Been with Adobe almost six years and prior to Adobe, uh, a background in higher ed, for 13 years at several different colleges as a faculty, department chair, dean of academic affairs. So happy to be here as well. All right. And so, go ahead. No. Uh, so to kind of start us off, I think the real question is that, that I ask myself when I'm trying to teach my students is how can one medical student reach thousands of people? Uh, and that's really the power of social media and um, digital tools in today's world. Uh, just to choose um, a, a case report, so to speak, uh, this is an example of one of our alums, VJ. He took the digital MD course. Uh, and uh, during the recent pandemic, where we all suffered a lot of isolation, a lot of frustration about misinformation and poor communication of public health information, uh, as a medical student really wanted to send out a message of, of hope and information. Uh, and VJ actually created this infographic uh, that shows the uh, impact of COVID-19 at the time, and more than just uh, the person who dies, but also the dozens of people who have symptoms or who have lung dysfunctions or who are financially burdened. And uh, it's not that he did an original research project, it's not that he had grant funding, but he took his access to medical information and his willingness to communicate that and created an infographic that is um, aesthetically pleasing, that is effective, that is simple. That infographic was shared on his personal social media accounts, and he's not exactly an influencer yet, 
Um, but that infographic was picked up by uh, physicians and public health authorities across the country and around the world, ultimately being uh, shared or retweeted about 400 times, quoted and liked thousands of times, translated into Arabic. And so in many ways, one infographic really had an impact on thousands of uh, people and potential patients around the world and, and really helped uh, Vijay in his, in his mission to educate. And so to go back to the beginning and kind of talk about how Digital MD came to be, um, I got to know Matt first in the fall of 2018 when I was a first year student at the School of Medicine. And we were introduced by one of the upperclassmen who had met me and learned that I had some experience working with Adobe throughout undergrad and creating since basically seventh grade from when I started middle school. Um, back then, digital literacy wasn't a sort of keyword as we see it now. And I was really lucky to have access and um, the opportunities to really start early in my life and um, start designing and start being creative digitally um, throughout my entire middle school, high school, and college years. And so when I met with Matt at first, our you know, back of the napkin idea in the coffee shop on campus was how do we take my experience in digital creativity and working with Adobe Solutions and Matt's experience in medical education and interest in social media. How can we merge those two into a course that is academically rigorous, but then also provides our learners with the knowledge and the tools necessary to make their ideas a reality um, using technology? And of course, our big question was, how can we make, uh, how can we help learners make a bigger impact using that technology? And of course, our focus was medical students in a traditionally not very creative and not very digitally uh, motivated field. How can we help our learners um, harness this power of our modern world? And we found that students are already using technology to tell their stories and affect their world, whether they're just casually sharing things on social media or creating more formal presentations or even websites. We are already making an impact using digital tools. But the problem is that digital literacy is kind of a hidden curriculum even still. Although students are engaging with these digital tools and their impact, it is seldom formally taught, and especially in medicine and our CU School of Medicine speaking specifically. Students look around them and they try to emulate what they're seeing, but it's not always professional or well-defined and certainly not academic. And so making this curriculum more accessible and explicit is what we wanted to achieve through Digital MD. And to better define the hidden curriculum, social media in modern times is just as helpful to medical practice as bedside manner. It's really part of the practice of medicine. And although CU School of Medicine focuses a lot on communication and bedside manner, in addition to our medical training, we don't really talk much about professional role modeling and development. And that is just as big a part of the practice of medicine as everything else. And honestly, physicians can't be expected to know this without some sort of training. And so before we dive into the details of Digital MD, let's talk a little bit about what motivates our students and for today, what motivates you? So take a moment to think about what's been on your mind this week. Or what are you feeling happy, sad, or angry about right now? And what would you share with an audience of a thousand people if given the chance? Uh, or if you're more graphically minded, um, just like on social media, what would you say publicly if given the opportunity uh, to put a message on a billboard on the busiest street in your town? And this process is the exact process that we guide our students through as they take Digital MD. And as you think about these questions and what's important to you right now in your life, let's talk about the development of Digital MD. Absolutely. And of course, it begins with... Uh, uh an impressive uh, visual uh, graphic. But uh, as with every great idea in academics or in education, uh, you can have the great idea, but then when it comes to brass tacks, it's important to have data. It's important to know what 
uh, whole are you fixing? Uh, what are the needs? And so we did do a formal needs assessment. Uh, Vincent and myself surveyed uh, the medical school. I'm pleased to say that we got 131 responses across all four years of training. Uh, even uh, more uh, uh, sort of impressive to me is the overwhelming response from our fourth year medical students, many of whom would never be able to take this elective uh, and who had already completed a lot of their training, but obviously felt compelled to contribute to uh, the future training of their uh, peers and uh, people behind them. And so we asked them, we tried to survey their attitudes and what do they agree with? What do they disagree with um, in terms of uh, what we're teaching? And we asked, I would like to be able to create digital educational content such as infographics, videos, posters, and animation. So this is a question of the students of what do they really want? Is this something that they're um, needing? And 50% of the respondents said that they agreed that they would indeed like to be able to create digital educational content such as infographics, videos, posters, and animations. These Many of these are the same graphics that they consume when they're studying for um, a, a medical exam or a pharmacology test. Um, and so they know that they exist and they would like to create them. And then um, we also asked if they know how to create digital educational content, such as infographics, videos, posters, and animations. And I think most of us would assume that anyone in this generation, anyone who's grown up surrounded by technology automatically has the skills and the knowledge to do so. But I think we were surprised by some of the responses. We found that only 20% of the respondents agreed that they actually knew how to create this content. And the vast majority uh, disagreed and said that they didn't know. Um, but maybe that's misleading. Maybe uh, we need to really focus on uh, the, the gap. So we further looked at our data and just looking at those who said, yes, I would like to be able to create these materials, those 65 yeses, uh, what's the breakdown of those that know how to actually do it? And looking at the breakdown, we found that only 23%, one in four of these students uh, had had solved that, had figured out how to create videos and images and audio. And before we move on, I think it's important to realize how really shocking that is. Medical students are by far uh, highly motivated, um, highly intelligent, highly adept at technology. Uh, many of these students were in their final year of training, and yet they still said there's something missing. There's something I would like to be able to do, but in the four years of undergraduate, the four years of medical school, I haven't really gotten there yet. And so I think that this data really pointed out to us that there is uh, a gap to solve and that um, we really needed to create this elective um, to address that need. Yeah, and if I might chime in with sort of my personal experience now being a fourth year medical student and approaching the end of my formal medical education before I get my MD, it is very, very clear that the process works as far as medical training. Every hour, every shift that I spend in the ED this month, I am learning new things, I am learning from my patients, and I'm getting the medical training and the sort of uh, foundation of a good career ahead of me as far as medical information and knowledge goes. And so too, that's true for communication as well. Medicine is just as much a customer service uh, role as it is a medical care role. And all of that comes together really nicely in the, in the last year of medical training. And I think many of us feel fairly prepared to enter our specialties as we graduate with our MDs. But like Matt said, this red bar here represents that gap where so far, have it not been for my experience in uh, digital creativity and my comfort in like creating uh, materials for online dissemination, it's really difficult to try and communicate my experience and um, my knowledge with patients and the general public in that way. And so to go over the course details, um, we designed our modules to meet this identified gap in our medical education. And our first module is a basic level definition of social media and digital scholarship. What exactly is social media? What forms does it come in? How does it change as we go from year to year? And what are its powers? And how can we use this as med medical students almost physicians uh, to contribute to the digital body of knowledge. 
uh, the second module, uh, Legal and Ethical Pitfalls of Online Citizenship. I think uh, this is the component of the course that keeps many school administrators uh, and um, admi and leaders at hospitals up at night. This is what they're really worried about. Um, very afraid that inadvertent release of uh, patients' medical information or an embarrassing photo will violate HIPAA or violate the law. It's one of the reasons why if you talk to many people at schools of medicine across the country about their social media curriculum, you will find that most of it focuses on avoiding it and don't doing it. It's very much an abstinence only approach uh, to social media and digital scholarship which honestly often uh, leads students being students uh, who are still motivated to share their opinions and their experiences. They still create uh, uh, or they still try to participate. And without sort of a formal exposure to this module too, um, there's a risk of uh, unprofessional behavior uh, and even uh, legal behavior. Uh, our third module is exploring the various roles of online citizens. So consumer, producer, synthesizer, or critic, or really a hybrid of all of these, whatever you're doing online, you're filling one of these basic roles at its core. So whether you're mostly consuming information and kind of lurking in the shadows of social media uh, or contributing and creating things, producing things, synthesizing information from different sources and critiquing those as far as validity and the way that they're presented. Um, all of these sort of contribute to one's role on social media. And this module focuses for our learners how to transition from being a consumer or a lurker to being a contributor contributor and engaging in activism about things that they care about using social media and the internet. Yes, I think module three is probably one of our more inspirational modules. Um, and, and then module four, developing a professional identity and a personal branding. I think this is something that a lot of our students hadn't actually taken a step back and really asked themselves these questions. But in the realm of medicine, we wanna be able to speak from uh, scientific authority, but we also wanna bring sort of a human side to things, um, the art of medicine. And I realize that when I'm seeing medical students, they're not just medical students. These are future surgeons and internists. Um, they are people who are uh, already, uh, a, a amidst their career. And so asking questions of mission and questions of branding can really help them discover the kind of online presence that they want to create, the kind of materials they want to make, and really the audience that they wish to speak to. And so, so often, uh, this is something that most physicians end up asking themselves, but very often far too late. So the session four really allows students to ask themselves, who am I uh, in person and online? Um, and real quick on this, this is something that like I've gone through in the past couple of years of my life, uh, developing what I want my professional identity to look like online and refining it over time. And that's this is a module that's very near and dear to my heart um, as far as helping my peers and my future colleagues uh, learn how to project themselves and create that brand. Our fifth module is on digital scholarship education theory. And before beginning any project, students learn to assess, evaluate, and improve upon the digital body of knowledge in medicine. And this really helps provide framing for the creation of that project. So just if you're a musician, just like music theory guides the composition of great pieces, or an educator uses flipped classroom or game theory for pedagogical reasons, so too does digital scholarship education theory guide the creation of digital digital media. And this is probably the most academic module of uh, our digital MD course. By the time we get to this module, students are pretty well versed in how to use social media, what digital scholarship means, and really applying this uh, digital scholarship education theory in terms of critiquing the current work that's out there, making it better for themselves, and creating something that can then be shared uh, with the online community afterward. And actually, just to add to a little bit about that module. I So often, so much of what's found online is lacking uh, because the creators have failed to really apply um, a theoretical construct or a mindset. They knew they wanted to make something, but they didn't uh, apply sort of Bloom's taxonomy to say, who is my learner? What is the uh, level of instruction that I'm looking at? Is it application? Is it synthesis? Is it critique? Um, and uh, they just go for it. I think most of us know that the wrong way to make a presentation is to sort of start in PowerPoint, right? You should back up to underlying theory and 
underlying purpose of, of any uh, presentation. Similarly, if someone, be it an infographic or a video or a podcast, is, is creating something, their first question needs to, be, needs to address that underpinning of um, educational theory, um, which really informs the process. And what we find is that this is very often, even, even among students that have made lots of things to put online, um, they haven't addressed the theoretical reasons behind it. This is reflective practice in many ways. This is what we teach future physicians. It's not just go and see a patient um, or go and do a physical exam, but it's ask yourself why you're asking the questions you're asking, why you're listening to the heart, why you're listening to the lungs, and it will make you better at what you're doing. And so I think um, module five is, is, I mean, it's a, it's a joy to teach. And then uh, going on to module six, which actually is also uh, quite a joy to teach. This is the fun side of things. This is uh, the lab side of the course where everyone is creative uh, with Adobe. And uh, this is where students uh, and, and myself and Vincent get to get our feet wet. Um, and um, after identifying, you know, a, a topic that the student is passionate about um, and uh, some learning objectives for the project, uh, we get to get our feet wet and really ask ourselves questions of design, questions of color, questions of sound. Um, we get to um, put some tape down so to speak. Uh, and that's um, a really enjoyable part of the process because it really does tie into the, uh, the humanity of the course, uh, the creative side, which so often, honestly, by the fourth year of medical school, many students have put aside. We have many students who can tell you of um, uh, the paintings they made in undergraduate or the poetry or the literature. Um, but on their fourth year and their 80th hour of the week, very often this side of them has been put aside. And so um, uh, letting that uh, creative out is, um, is really a joy to see in the classroom. Absolutely. And after that lab component, students create, uh, you know, th either through the lab or afterward, um, they'll can create a capstone educational project to the course portfolio website. And we display them and share them among all of our learners um, for distribution and feedback. And the end goal is to empower students with the knowledge and technical skills to apply their expertise via a project in digital scholarship. And in many ways, students go into the world of online scholarship without any honest, helpful feedback on it. And so our final week is dedicated to reviewing those projects that they've created and providing a reflective approach to this content with candid feedback from peers, instructors, and the online community as a whole. And this is a big part of our course's reflection and evaluation of what we've created and how we can do better the second time. I think any creator can tell you the first couple of times they create something, myself included, is not very impressive and not very exciting to share, but getting feedback about what could be done better, what was unclear, and just you know what was good about it and what we could keep doing in the future is really helpful to hear from our people. Years. And it's really high quality feedback. I think anyone who's watching this, who's created uh, social media, who's created uh, um, an Instagram video or something else, very often you either get no feedback or uh, there is a perverse reward for disinformation um, or uh, for content that is out of the mainstream or the norm. And so um, when you're sitting with your peers, when you're sitting with uh, medical professionals, um, there is a uh, a higher level um, and uh, a focus of uh, on quality rather than just engagement and clicks. Although those are important for audiences, um, uh, as with everything, we want our medical students to be guided by um, a search for quality in everything they do. That's right. And along those lines for search for quality, these are a couple of capstones that our students, our graduates of Digital MD, have created over the last couple semesters. So there's VJ's infographic on COVID-19 on the right, the one that went viral on Twitter that we showed at the beginning. Um, on the very left is very early, if this was like February 2020, that one of our students created a myth versus fact infographic on COVID-19 as well, and also shared it on Twitter um, to a good response as well. But this is a good example of how students can use these digital tools to really engage with 
modern and current conversations about healthcare and share their expertise. Um, in the middle is another project made by a different student who contributed to our uh, guidebook that we give to every first year incoming med student. Um, and this one is about the importance of well being and how um, give some, it shares some statistics about med students burnout and how we can utilize the resources that CU provides to make better, uh, make ourselves better and take care of ourselves and practice good like self care for mental uh, well being. And so obviously a student can make a project about whatever they're passionate about. Um, and in whatever formats they're passionate about too. Um, while still images and infographics have been popular um, just because it's so easy to access and share, other students have chosen video and audio formats to share their ideas too, um, whether it's a quick Adobe Spark video or a podcast episode that they're working on uh, with the Office of Student Life. Yeah, and I think what Vincent is uh, really alluding to here is uh, we we designed the course, we we did the needs assessment, we came up with the course objectives and the module objectives and the assessment maps, but the students really do lead it. I I could not have told you over the last few years uh, what projects would have been created. We've had students who have been passionate about uh, recycling of medications and wanting to reach out. Um, uh, to a variety of communities about that. Obviously, during the recent pandemic, when honestly, most of us felt isolated and frustrated um, and wanted to reach out uh, to a greater world, uh, many of our students created messaging surrounding COVID. And now as uh, uh, wellness and um, uh, study habits and uh, sort of a focus on um, a better day is out there for medical students. A lot of our students have created uh, products that are aimed at educating their peers to help them out. Um, and so it's really inspirational to see uh, what students have created. Um, it's been a huge recharge for my battery in terms of um, providing structure and framework for these students to create something. It's, it's very similar to um, medical school. Um, uh, we are now starting a new uh, first year medical uh, student class, um, and I am incredibly excited uh, to find out where these students will be in four years, what fields they will be going into, and what ultimately uh, where their course will take them. So uh, this, this similarly, the Digital MD course has been a great opportunity to tap into the passions of my students and uh, to support them uh, uh, in creating an explicit curriculum that goes beyond the hidden curriculum that, that um, really supports them in their passions. That's right. And so in a nutshell, Digital MD is designed to, again, provide the knowledge and tools for students to bring their ideas to life. And we've talked a lot about how this applies to medical students and future physicians, but I think it's also important to remember that it really is at its core proof that everyone is creative. And regardless of discipline or field and, and whatever your academic interest lies in, you too can create something that makes an impact in your circles. So really digital MD, the concept of it can be applied to digital PhD, digital MBA, digital MS, digital BS, whatever your degree it happens to be and whatever your uh, discipline happens to be. It really is something that is applicable to education in that field. And so to circle back, um, just we will have time for questions at the end. But for now, let's get back to this question. What are you passionate about this week or today? And in this next section, we'll walk you through Adobe Spark, which is free and a great entry point for people of all skill levels to start their creative journeys and sharing information with the online community in a format that is easily consumable and engaging as well. And so I'd like to introduce uh, Jason. I know we kind of talked earlier, but um, Jason is a very close friend of mine. Um, he, we've known each other since he uh, first was a um, account manager, a customer success manager for the University of Utah, where I was studying an undergrad. Um, and I served as an Adobe uh, campus representative. I presented some workshops and got to know Jason through creating that picture at the University of Utah and really spearheading the digital literacy conversation. Um, really, uh, he and I have, you know, had many good opportunities to work together. Um, we have partnered on a lot of different things. And so it's really a joy to still be presenting um, with Jason. And a few weeks ago, I celebrated my five year anniversary of uh, presenting and working with Adobe. So it really has been a huge part of my life. So Jason, I'll turn it over to you. 
Thanks, Vincent. Nice picture. Boy, that does look five years ago. <laughs> got a little bit of uh, extra wisdom going here. Uh, sound check. Can you guys hear me okay? Uh, yes. There's no reverb because I've got a couple things going on I want to show everybody. Uh, sounds good? Medium? Medium good. Medium good. I'll take it. I'll take it. So uh, let me share my screen here. And I thought Vincent had asked me to uh, dive in with the audience on Adobe Premiere Pro, our flagship video editing program that's used across Hollywood and other broadcast endeavors. So I guess I better pivot real quick. And, and instead I'll bring up Adobe Premiere Rush, which is our newer video app that runs on not only laptops and desktop computers, but also mobile devices. Uh, but actually, I'll stick with Adobe Spark. But the reason I brought up the interfaces here is because we, we realize that Adobe, we want to meet students where they are. You know, everybody's learning. Everybody has a mobile device. These days, maybe students aren't in physical classrooms or labs. So we did a whole retooling uh, of a lot of our applications and brought out some new ones. So if we just did a quick comparison of the screenshot here, this is Adobe Premiere Pro, the, the airplane cockpit interface. And this is the retooled Adobe Premiere Rush, still a video editing application, but a lot lighter weight and a lot more approachable for new learners that maybe aren't uh, going to embark on careers in, in you know, multimedia or uh, creation of media artifacts. So just a quick you know, A-B comparison there. And then let's push over to Adobe Spark, which, which Vincent actually did ask me to, to talk about today. This one runs in a web browser. So that means for our, even our K through 12 audience, you know, with Chromebooks, they're able to use these creation tools just by navigating to this website. And I'll copy and paste this into the chat. For, for uh, individuals, the, the tools are free to use. So anyone, you know, 13 or over can sign up with a, with a free account on adobe.com. If you're under 13 parents, permission, of course. Uh, but really, the, the tools also run on a mobile device. So I'm trying to do a little split screen here, and I'll move this over. This, uh, on the left-hand side, this is Adobe Spark Post that's running on, on my iPhone. So if I uh, navigate, so I'm working off my iPhone, so you can see touch-centric as I swipe on my phone. Uh, you know, you're seeing the interface on screen here. This is my, the interface of my phone. And the reason I mention that is because inspiration is really all around us. I can only imagine being an emergency room physician. Really, I can only imagine. But if I'm seized by inspiration, you know, having coffee or after work or before work, or if I'm a student learner walking across a campus or riding public transit, if the inspiration hits me, I want to be able, the, the cocktail napkin I, uh, idea is nice, but I'd like to be able to whip out my phone and rather than consume TikTok videos, I'd rather work on my own creation. So, so you're seeing the split screen there. I'll widen this, this back over. So you're seeing the, the full screen browser here. So the other thing I, I realize, it, and Adobe realizes for that matter, is everybody's creative, yes, but not everybody is a trained designer. So when we enter the Spark interface and we get the opportunity, let me go back home here, to tell our story, because that's what Vincent and, and, and Matthew are, are, are talking about today, we can get started very quickly. So there's a lot of pre-built options here. Let's say I want to make an Instagram story. What I don't want is the fear of the blank white canvas, because remember, I'm not a designer. I've got four minutes. I've got a little bit of inspiration. I want to begin at a jumping off point, probably beyond what I could have done as a non-designer, non-trained designer anyway. So, so if I put myself in the role of a, a, a student, perhaps I'm on student government, I wanna get people back to campus, I wanna create an event with my team, and let's say it's a, a career fair. So I can easily on the right-hand side here do a little word matching. And as I type career fair, all of these templates are served up based on that keyword match that I can begin from. So the fear of the white canvas versus something else that's been created, hopefully by a designer or a pseudo or wannabe designer. And I can jump off from that, that point of view. So let's try 
over here, I, I, I click on the template. It looks pretty good as far as the thumbnail. Let's create from this template. And this loads into my repository of projects now that are all cloud-based. So if, if there's a, you know, an interruption or you know, I got to get back to work or what have you, all of this is saved all the time. I don't need to save it off on a thumb drive or email it to myself as an attachment, nothing like that. Furthermore, each of these items is individually editable. So if I don't like the what's your big idea and I want to say, you know, what's your, if I double tap there and now I got have a text interface over here and you can see it's highlighted with this blue dot and keep in mind that from overall, this is a fairly non-intimidating user interface. So if it's my first time in Spark Post, there's a very flat learning curve. I don't have to spend time in a classroom teaching this, the tool. I can hand it off to, to students, to learners to let them you know, experiment and explore on their own. So let's call it, uh, what's your next? Whoop, I got a double X in there. And then over here, I'll double tap on the idea part. And this is like a, the what is part of the idea is part of the text block. And I'll say, what's your next job, right? Since we're gonna do a career fair. And the next obviously is kind of uh, spilling over the word your, so I can just click and drag and I've got these nice little handles and I can pull these around. And so, it, so the text layout looks pretty readable, pretty clean. So each of these items as I tap on it becomes an editable item. So this little paint stroke here, you know, maybe if my school colors are, are gold and black, I can quickly change to get some other examples here. There are some branding features. So if I pulled in some color palettes, those persist and I can reuse and remix and recreate other items, other signage, other graphics, abiding by that, those same branding, those same color palettes. So let's put in the gold. I've got another one down here and let's use the same gold. So each of these items is editable. Um, you can see if there's a, these are icons. So if I wanted to replace this one, the paint stroke, now I've got a whole bunch of uh, opportunities to use based on the word squiggle here. If I don't like the word squiggle, let's go to, uh, you know, uh, bolt. I don't know, keyword matching here. I was thinking lightning bolt, something like, something like this, right? And now that, that item is pulled in. So if you're thinking about the, you know, what's it matter to me, the, the how, the when, the where, the why, this is a uh, career fair. I want to get this out to my audience very quickly. Um, career fair on campus, campus and virtual, right? Got to have both options. And then, you know, a, a, a paragraph. So if I'm the copywriter, I can, you know, text write it here. If I've got a Word document open that my colleague or other contributor wrote, I can just copy paste that into the text box that describes what the event is, who's invited, dress up or not dress up, bring your uh, resume, bring your portfolio, you know, here, here's the date, time, location, and then perhaps a, a web address where I can find out more information. Um, the background here, if I don't like the blue, I can obviously work from a, a color palette. I've got all my, my color picking tools here, or I can pull in an image if I have one on my device. So if I'm working from my phone, I can work from the camera roll directly from my phone if I took a photo or I can find free photos across several free providers, Pixabay and Unsplash. And let's search for uh, abstract, something in the background here. You know, even just a texture to put behind there. And these are all royalty free, uh, you know, without copyright restrictions. Um, I, it's a little busy. So if I wanna give it, give it a little blur, I've got a blur filter here, and then I can up the amount of blur just to give me a little bit of texture. And then perhaps on the enhancements, I'll pull down the brightness so the contrast is a little bit, a little bit better here. Uh, we're almost done. I like it. If I want to get Vincent's or, or, or Matt's opinion on it, I can invite them to collaborate on the item. So, you know, Vincent is probably in my database of people here somewhere. And perhaps not because it's Vincent, what's your email address real quick? Uh, Vincent Fu, V-A-N-C-E-N-T-F-U, at Outlook.com. There we go. 
And what's your phone number and your social? <laughs> That's the next course on uh, on privacy across the internet, right? Yeah. <laughs> if the IRS is calling you, don't answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, so here's my quick message and invite to edit. And I'll get notified once he accepts the, the invitation. And he'll have the same instance of this flyer on his creation device, whether it's his mobile device or, or web browser, so he can continue or you know, pick up that baton where I left off. And I can do the same for Matt or any number of collaborators. In a classroom setting, uh, often the prof will start with the template and then invite his students to, to collaborate there. I probably wanna give it a name, career fair next week, something like that. And then let's, let's say it's done. I, it's not really up to my standards, but I know we're on limited time here. So a couple options here, and they're in the download and share category. So if I click on share, I can choose to publish it or invite, send to Google Drive or make a brand new template where this becomes the jumping off point for the next creators. So let's choose publish. And here tied in with, with Matt and Vincent's class, the ability to publish right to my social media account directly from Adobe Spark. I don't need to navigate out and log in separately and then download this item and then upload it again. There's definitely less steps involved. But let's say I just want to have a link to it and I'll, I'll copy that link. And now this is an Adobe hosted graphic that you can you know, use, copy the URL and, and, and tweet it directly or post it to Facebook or send it out as an attachment on an email, what have you. There are some publish options. If I wanted to add those, if I didn't, I can leave it blank and then it wouldn't be searchable by my name or across any search engines. I certainly don't mind that, that it is. So I'll choose education and turn on the discoverability and choose that update link. Uh, for a traditional learners in say an undergraduate classroom, they might even choose to, to copy this URL and uh, insert it in an LMS, you know, a Dropbox or, or inbox for, for grading or assessment or for further discussion amongst a class. Uh, the last thing here is I can download it. So it becomes a file that I can print out and put on a, you know, a display board or hand off like flyers and, you know, for on campus and then, you know, multiple formats for, for, for that graphic. So I'll change it to JPEG and start the download. And it ends, ends up as an image that just sits on, on my computer as a standalone outside of Adobe Spark. So that's the creation process. What I want to end with is going back to my device. Uh, let's say I, I made a spelling mistake and Vincent emails me, you know, 11 p.m. at night and I, I spelled something wrong and he wants me to fix it. He doesn't want to do my dirty work for me. I can just open up my mobile device. And now you can see that this, this flyer is the first one listed in my queue of previous creations. So if I just click on it, again, I'm working directly from my mobile device now. And, and I want to work on this here. Oh, it says open the, on the desktop because I shared it with Vincent. So I'm not going to be able to edit it right now uh, because I have to remove Vincent's share so I can finish it up here. But know that, you know, without doing the, the sharing, the collaboration, I'm able to continue creating on my device and, and do that across devices for whatever I'm, I'm logged into, wherever I'm logged in, whether it's a desktop, a laptop, a Chromebook, or a, or a mobile device. I'll pick my other one here, and I've been working on that before. This is far more touch-centric. So, so as I just use my, my finger and move this text box around, you can see how the item, the text reflows there. And as I pick each one, you know, it's got these touch-centric handles. So I know for many new learners new to creation of digital media, this is a more welcome tactile exercise than perhaps navigating across a, a web page would be. I'll hit done here and, uh, and I'll stop sharing screen, but basically Adobe Spark across the web browser connects to your mobile device, allows for collaboration, and then you can download or share the, the resulting graphic that you create. I would, if I can, I would just also add that, so Spark is definitely helpful and it's a great almost gateway entry to some of the Adobe suite products. I've definitely, as was alluded to, when you're in emergency medicine, you, I don't work in an office most of the time. I might have a laptop, but my phone is where I do a lot of my work. And, and so uh, it definitely truth 
be told, I can even share. I've had uh, times where I wanted to uh, create uh, um, a learning pearl that I want to disseminate on uh, Twitter or Instagram. Uh, we've even done differential diagnoses uh, images uh, to try to figure out what's going on with a patient. And it's often when you have the passion and the energy to start a project, you want to do it right then and there. And so I, I mean, literally have pulled out my phone and started working on something right then and there, and then maybe picked it up later on, um, or created uh, inspirational graphics. Or similarly, this is more of an issue with me, but in medicine, we love to be on Twitter all the time, and we can't figure out so much how to do medical education on Instagram, which is so visually focused. But something like Adobe Spark definitely makes it easy to create um, a pearl, a learning pearl about medication storage, or about even how drugs are metabolized, and just to really grab an image and create something visual that's formatted appropriately for Instagram and then share it. So, I mean, it's, it's not just fiction. I've definitely numerous times done exactly what Jason is talking about in terms of um, uh, content creation in the moment. Nice. Absolutely. And to sort of add to that, a couple highlights of Spark that I really enjoy using is the flexibility. So as you can see, Jason shared that project with me. I was able to open it immediately. And although he's editing it right now, I can see all the latest changes. I can see the spelling mistake, career fair next week. And, <laughs> um, you know, always it's, it's so collaborative and it's so mobile. I think that's the beauty of it. And like Matt was saying, if there's some idea that pops into your head while you're out and about and you want to at least get the thing started, you can do so using free Adobe Spark apps on your phone, whether it's a post, whether it's a video, whether it's something else. Um, Adobe Spark has a solution that can help you create like a web page for it too. And you can start it on your phone or iPad or laptop or tablet or anything. And and then come back to the computer and refine it or do it completely on the phone. And since we have a little extra time, uh, I'd like to share a little Adobe Spark page that I created. Um, this is something that I always wanted to challenge myself because coming from a long history of desktop design from before, you know, before when mobile apps and touch uh, designing was even a concept, um, you know, we had learned on Photoshop and Illustrator and things like that on the desktop. And so I wanted to challenge myself and say, all right, I always preach personal branding, being able to create your own graphics and logos and things like that. Can I do that using only mobile apps, using only my phone? And so I went through and kind of recreated my brand and created this Adobe Spark page as a exercise in creating everything from just my mobile device on my phone. So like Jason uh, alluded to with the Premiere Rush at the beginning, um, Premiere Rush is not only a simplified desktop app compared to Premiere Pro, um, but it's also a mobile app. And I created this entire like intro video um, using just the mobile uh, version of Premiere Rush. And after that, I went into a Spark post and oh, this is made using Photoshop camera. So even if you don't have any formal uh, Photoshop skills on the computer, you can use a very simple app to touch up your portraits and you can use Spark post to create a logo like this. Um, and so also a business card I created in Spark post. And so this one page sort of resume is meant as a quick thing that you can send along with your application to whatever job, whatever career, whatever discipline you're in. In as a one minute intro video. Here's my picture. Here's, you know, a little bit about my brand. Here's my business card, digital. Um, and you can also export it, like Jason said, into a format that then you can print if you'd like it in a printed version. But all of this is possible using the free Spark mobile apps. And if you're curious, I will paste this link in the uh, chat. And there's also a how-to page that I made also using Adobe Spark um, that kind of walks you through step-by-step. Step. So if what we showed you today in 10 minutes or 15 minutes, um, if you're not able to you know, kind of process every single step that happened here, here I have a tutorial page that kind of walks you through step-by-step step how to use Photoshop camera to edit the selfie, um, what effects I used um, for my logo, what things I used in Adobe Spark, how to add the background, just like Jason demoed earlier. I searched gradient. I found one that fit well, put my logo on top of it, um, you know, resized it using all touch controls on the phone. Same thing with the business card, step-by-step, step, how to set it to business card size, um, edit the text, um, position things the way I wanted to add my contact information. And then for the intro video, this is a peek into the Adobe Rush um, Premiere Rush mobile app and how you can edit everything, add text, add images, add music, 
um, to make to create a really engaging one minute video all from your phone. And so if you're interested to kind of get your feet wet with Adobe Spark and try it yourself, this page is there for you as well. And then at the end, I have um, a tutorial on how to put it all together into the Adobe Spark web page that is then shareable with a link. So I will paste this link in the chat as well um, for your uh, reading pleasure. <laughs> and so to kind of switch back to our presentation um, and kind of wrap things up, uh, Matt and I are really excited to share this with you today at Colt, and we would love to see what you create. And so using the tutorials and using Adobe Spark, um, if you have some time after the session and have an idea that's been on your mind and that you want to share with the world, feel free to hashtag DigitalMD and tag us on Twitter um, and Instagram as well. We would love to see what you come up with, and we would love to connect and engage with you in uh, whatever discipline or field that you might be in. Very nice. I think that was a lot of stuff that we talked about, uh, ranging from creation of a course to the teaching of a course to some of the tools that we use. Um, is there another slide? Yes. Yeah, I think, yeah. So is this, if anyone, if anyone there has any questions or comments or anything they said, anything they heard said, there's no way I could do this at my institution or, you know, had a technical question or, um, or comment, uh, now would be the, the time. Oh, and thank you, Michael. Agreed. I find I find the whole thing very interesting. <laughs> A quiet audience today. So it's that afternoon. It's that afternoon. Uh session. Uh, and I would I would also just say that even though we've been really focusing on Spark and doing things on mobile, um, uh, my entry into uh, using some of these tools really started with podcasting and starting with some of the free tools and then shifting towards more professional tools. Because as with anything, once you start getting creative with something, it's sort of you want to do more and more. And so I think a lot of medical education podcasts are actually created with uh, some of the Adobe Suite tools. And then you say, well, it's nice for an audio podcast, but I'd really like to show them a video. And I've definitely helped colleagues make uh, educational videos on uh, how to create um, uh, an albuterol spacer uh, in a third world environment or developing country environment, um, all the way up to um, you know how to run a resuscitation. So. Um, the tools tend to find their way into whatever uh, project you uh, have in front of you. I know Vincent has used some of these tools and even some of his med school assignments. It's definitely true. I think the best way to learn isn't necessarily to take a course or try and like power your way through projects that you're just doing just to learn. It's really better to have applications that are real world applications. Um, so, you know, for example, my, uh, all my presentation posters that I share at symposiums and research uh, presentations are made in Adobe Illustrator rather than the typical uh, PowerPoint uh, poster that people like template that people get from the library website and work from. So it's it's a source of pride for me to be able to create my own uh, sort of visual presentations and take things to the next level um, while presenting in medicine and science. Yeah, and similarly, I think, um, uh, Jennifer, it's great that you um, uh, work in, at the uh, dental school. That's, I mean, that's a perfect example, right? I think, and that's something I hadn't even thought of, actually. This is a great example of, I don't always see where things are going, but creating uh, information, be it about appropriate dental hygiene or creating educational videos for students about, you know, identifying uh, dental disease. Um, I think that there's probably a lot of things that your students have to say and would appreciate access to the tools to say them. Yeah. All right, Digital guys. Um, I think we are all wrapped up here. Uh, that was super interesting. Um, I'm an architecture student, and so I use Adobe products left and right. Um, so it was interesting to watch that on my end, uh, totally opposite of a medical field. So, um, But this recording will be um, available on the Hub in a few hours once it finishes uploading, and people can uh, view it after that. Thanks, Ariel. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Matt. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. Thank you yeah, so no much. Problem. Have a good rest of your day. You too, everybody. Thank you. Oh, no, it's just that.